up, everybody? Welcome into a brand new episode of Forever Power 5 on the Empty the Bench Network. Uh, I'm Nick Martino. That's Anthony Ballister. That's Nick Bando. You can follow me on Twitter at Nick DMart. You can follow Zan at ZamBando99 on Twitter and Instagram. You can follow Anthony on Twitter and Instagram at Ballister555. Uh, you can find this show on YouTube. You can follow this show and all of you can watch the show and all other empty the bed shows on YouTube.com slash ETB network. You can listen to this show on and all empty the bed shows on ETB podcast.com. You can listen to forever. You can listen to forever power five, wherever you get your podcasts. And of course this show forever power five, it is presented by playback. Watching sports is more fun with others, but we spend too much of our time watching alone. Playback is a virtual space where communities can stream live sports together with everyone perfectly synced up. Creators can hop on stage, deliver their own play-by-play analysis and commentary, and invite viewers up for Q&A. Playback makes watching sports fully interactive and a social experience. From playing fantasy sports, wrapping your favorite players and teams, and watching with the commentators and communities you care about. Win or lose, sports are best enjoyed together. Join our community by going to playback.tv slash ETB network to find out more, including our live stream schedule. All right. So let's get into the show. Um, a big monkey wrench was thrown into the whole uh, Big Ten playoff picture. Uh, Michigan upsets USC. The minor upset is how I would put it. I mean, a big game, but like they were slight underdogs. They win a big game at home. Uh, I saw uh, th- this game was it, it was tough played from both sides. I would say uh, Michigan with a huge quarterback overhaul. This game, I mean, it, I, I was sort of surprised at the result, but I probably maybe shouldn't be. But I am a little bit surprised. I am a little bit. Part of me is very surprised that Michigan went from a quarterback who throws and switched to a guy who doesn't. And that seems to be such an upgrade. Yeah. I mean, that's the wild part about it. You got Alex Orgy coming in, you know, to replace Davis Warren and no one really knew how he was going to do. And he was uh, definitely uh, respectable, of course. And uh, they were able to keep the home crowd in it. It was nice to see what USC was able to do. They were able to, they were able to rally from, a small deficit. It looked like they were going to go win the game. And then, of course, Michigan won on the final series there. Um, I think USC had bad clock management near the end of the game. I think if they would have had maybe 30 more seconds to a minute. And if they would have used the sideline a little bit more, they would have potentially had a chance to tie the game. But a loss, uh, that didn't happen. And uh, this is definitely a, a momentum swing game for Michigan. You know, you come off of a win kind of an uglier win against an Arkansas State team that had no business uh, being in that game at the big house despite a couple garbage time touchdowns in the fourth quarter to make the game closer than what it was. And now everyone is slowly but surely getting back onto the Michigan hype train and rightfully so. I mean, it seems like now the Big Ten is, you know, potentially a four-team race uh, with the third team potentially being Illinois. I don't think we really know how Illinois' ceiling is yet, but you still have – Oregon, Ohio State, and Michigan near the top. So as long as you have those three teams still in contention, uh, the top of the Big Ten is fine and dandy. And now that the conference games are slowly but surely starting, these teams are going to go in and beat the heck out of each other. So now we're going to get to see some more clarity separating the the uh, the contenders from the pretenders, if you will. And I think another interesting thing to take a look at, too, this was USC's first cross-country game as a member of the Big Ten, I thought they played pretty well. I thought they played well enough to win. Uh, they're going to have to do this um, moving forward later this year and obviously in future years. So I think from a from an effort standpoint, uh, Miller, Moss, Lincoln, Riley, and USC played well. It was just too little, too late. Uh, they left Michigan a little bit too much time. And uh, Mullins for Michigan at running back had another, had another solid day. And he's someone who's quietly becoming – one of the best running backs in all of college football. He continues to get better and better every week. So overall, a resilient win for the Wolverines, a heartbreaker for USC. But this is going to be a norm with some of these top teams. You're going to get these shootouts um, in the Big Ten where you least expect it. And uh, this game over-delivered and then some in the two in the 330 window, rather, on CBS. I thought it was I thought it was a good game. What did you guys think? Well, obviously, it, it was probably the best, well, the second best game, I would say, of of the weekend. But the best of 
rank the best ranked game is how I, is how I would put it. Um, I, I mean, yeah, this this obviously has huge playoff implications. I don't know, Anthony. What, what was your reaction to this? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I said coming into this that this may be a trap game. Um, you know, we saw Michigan, um, you know, get embarrassed when they play Texas um, at home. So I know I was definitely tough to see, you know, them getting embarrassed again. Um, but I, I fell for the trap. Um, I, I, I didn't go for it. You know, I should have picked uh, Michigan heading into this game and I'm um, sure for uh, not picking them. Um, this had a trap game written all over it and I should have saw it ahead of time. Um, but Khalil Mullins, I mean, a potential breakout star in college football. And it's crazy because, you know, we've seen a guy like Diamond Edwards um, behind Blake Corum for so long. We thought Diamond Edwards was going to be the breakout back. Um, but it's not. It's Mullins. And I've been very impressed with him. And I think, you know, making Alex Orgy the starting quarterback was the best decision. I was honestly surprised that he wasn't the full time starter, getting all the reps to start the season. I understand that he may be limited in terms of passing, but Michigan is a team that likes to run the ball anyways. And having him back there with his uh, athleticism is kind of like having another running back back there. And I think this is definitely the move for Michigan. Um, Michigan's definitely going to be a tough team, you know, to play against going forward. Um, but I was definitely impressed with USC. You know, defensively, um, they definitely still show improvements from last year. If this was the defense from a year ago, this wouldn't have been close at all. Um, but the defense definitely showed grit and had its moments. But they definitely got to improve their run defense. Um, Miller Moss and the offense did good as well. Like Zan said, you know, some clock management. Um, but overall, USC, you know, played good and tried to make it um, a win for them. Unfortunately, it didn't go their way. Um, but, man, Michigan seems like, you know, they've uh, made a turn and they seem like a team that you don't want to play right now. Yeah, and yeah. thankfully for the Wolverines, yeah. you know, they've got a Minnesota Golden Gophers team coming up where you still really haven't figured out uh, what P.J. Flex team has. So that, that'll that be an interesting game uh, in the big house to see if Michigan can maintain uh, its momentum. I think this is a team, just as Anthony alluded to, this was a get-right game for the Wolverines after not playing as well against the now number one team in the country in Texas. And uh, the, it definitely looked like a team where if you, uh, if you kind of let them, uh, if you, you kind of let them find an opening and find the hunted, if you will, they're going to, they're going to seize it. And that's exactly what they were able to do against USC over the weekend. Well, I, I mean, Anthony talking about Alex orgy, I mean, the obvious reason they started Davis Warren is because he actually throws the ball. Now he doesn't throw it well, um, and now usually Davis Warren, he does throw it to the other team. Um, <laughs> so I guess not throwing it is better than throwing it to the other team. Right. But the reason is obviously because you kind of have to have a quarterback who can throw. I mean, even in college football where you can win great with running court, where you can win national championships with running quarterbacks a lot more easily than you can in the NFL. You still have to have a guy who has some type of an arm and you can be a running quarterback or a dual threat quarterback and still be able to throw and Alex Orgy, I mean, he threw the ball 12 times against USC, and that was kind of pushing it. He went 7 for 12, and his average uh, pass was 2.7 yards, so less than 3 yards per pass. Um, so, and like, that obviously is a problem. And let me just say, I mean, like, I'm giving Michigan credit for them beating USC, but the point I'm making is the reason they started Alex Orgy, it's like, most of the time, quarterback controversies are bad. Occasionally, they're good. Texas is a good quarterback controversy. But most of the time, quarterback controversies are bad. And in this case, for Michigan, this was a bad quarterback controversy. It's a bad quarterback controversy when you have to bench your quarterback who throws with a guy who doesn't because the quarterback who throws is throwing the ball to the other team. It's like not eating because all the food in your house is poisonous. Like that's essentially what what the 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 uh, the position that Michigan was in. They were not in a good position. Uh, I mean, it could very well be true that they needed Davis Warren to have such a bad game against Arkansas State to finally bench him and start Alex Orgy, and that could have been the reason they beat USC. I mean, that very well could be possible. Um, and yeah, it was a get right game for Michigan. It was a get right game and it, it very well easily could affect their momentum or whatever. Now I will say, I'll, I'll say this. I think that when you look at this affects the big 10 playoff picture quite a lot. And, and, you know, and obviously will affect all of college football to some extent. Now, after Notre Dame beat Illinois, uh, lost to Northern Illinois, all the all of sports media or college football media or much of it 
much of them very much overreacted to that loss in the sense that they overreacted by saying Notre Dame season is finished, done. I didn't. You I didn't. Didn't. Not yep. saying everybody. I don't remember you saying that. Uh, I don't remember you saying that. Just a lot of people in. I did. Know, I I did notice that part though. You're right. You're right. A lot of because I mean that's a common thing. People like to overreact. Whatever. Um, now I will also say now even though Notre Dame is not Notre Dame is not a Big Ten team. They're not even affiliated with the Big Ten, but they're very much going to affect the Big Ten because of their matchup with USC. And that's going to very much affect the Big Ten playoff picture. Now, even though everybody's really especially if Notre Dame still has one it's still has one or maybe even two losses by the end of the year. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, the, yeah. And now the funny thing to me is right now everybody is really high on Michigan. And two weeks ago, everybody was really down on Notre Dame. I'll say this. I think Notre Dame actually has a significantly better chance at making the playoffs than Michigan does. I mean, Michigan, even though they have this big win, uh, big win at home against USC, which is, you know, no slouch. That's a good win. Notre Dame's chances of making the playoffs are honestly infinitely higher than Michigan's. I mean, I don't think Michigan is a title contender. Michigan is not a playoff team. Enjoy this win, Wolverines fans. But there's almost no way. I mean, like, just their situation. Like, I I am not sold on Alex Orgy at all because he doesn't throw the ball. I'm not either. Uh, he doesn't throw and he went seven for 12 less than three yards per pass like that is an offense with training wheels on it and you can get away with it a little bit usc is a young team and uh michigan's defense was great and you know that you can you can do like it, it, don't get me wrong it's a tough win to pull off but that's not gonna work every game and they're nope. they, they they're in too difficult of a conference i mean first of all them, Michigan, they have to play Oregon at home and go on the road to Ohio State. Are you telling me that they're going to go on the road and beat Ohio State, who is like the who is now the second ranked team in the uh, sorry third ranked team in the country, and beat them with a quarterback who doesn't throw? It's and not they to, happen. and they have to go on the road to Washington a week from this Saturday. I think that's yeah. where you're going to see Alex Orgy struggle the most when he starts to get on the road in those hostile environments. Where you know things are where the plays breaking down and things like that, um, I think that that's where he's going to struggle. And I think you know there may be some upsets in there for Michigan. And you know you know what's going to happen is though for USC, um, you know there may be a chance that both these teams have similar records um, at the end of the year. Um, and that head to head may be the tiebreaker between these two. But yeah, I would definitely say Notre Dame has a better chance of making the playoffs than uh, probably either of these teams. Yeah. Yeah, I mean if you look at I'm. And just speaking of USC, you know, you look at their upcoming schedule. We're going to preview the Wisconsin game in a little bit. You have a pretty good Penn State team coming to Southern California. You got a Rutgers team that's at a sneaky start to the season. You have a potential trap game against uh, against Minnesota in Minneapolis, and you also have to play Washington at UW. It's not. It's not easy. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, just because this particular game went well for Michigan and not to mention they were at home and it was USC's first uh, cross-country, as you mentioned, Zan, cross-country Big Ten game. Uh, and, you know, it's obviously a lot harder to go from the West Coast to the East Coast than it is to go from the East Coast to the West Coast. So that uh, that has to be taken into account. And, you know, there's a lot of games. I mean, Michigan, Michigan has to go on the road at Washington at Illinois. At Illinois, I mean, not which I games I didn't mention. There's a good chance they lose one of those games too. Uh, and a nine and three Michigan team is not a playoff team. And, and from what I've seen from Michigan, like they just aren't on the same. They don't seem to be on the same level as Oregon or Ohio State. No, like a nine, nine and three close. Michigan team sounds almost sounds like the best case scenario. And I'm not fully convinced that's even going to happen. I mean, they're a bowl game team, but the oh, truth sure. is. I mean, this is a big win, obviously, but it's like I, I don't think Michigan really – like they're just obviously not title contenders. No, not even close. I mean, it's, yeah, go go ahead. No, I was just going to say too. I mean, you sort of alluded to it, but, you know, adding four teams into the Big Ten for some people, that may not seem like a big deal, but that's a huge deal. You just alluded to it. You have to go cross country to play Washington. You have to go to Ohio State. It looks like an absolute wagon so far with the talent they have. You have to go to a 
a, a surging potential contender in Illinois in, in October and what's being built as the Memorial Stadium 100-year dedication game. You have to also play Oregon. Like There are a lot of games where Michigan could easily lose. So, I mean, I personally think even though they barely beat USC 8-4 and four or 9-3, and three, it's not out of the question. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely. Anthony, what do you think? No, 100%. Um, I'd probably say, yeah, they're probably more closer to that eight or nine wins than they are being 10 wins. Um, I definitely see a hard time Michigan making the playoffs. They're definitely going to slip up a game here and two, especially on the road. And I think there's just a, a good amount of teams. Well, not a good amount of teams, but a few teams in the Big Ten that's better. You know, obviously we spoke, we spoke you know, Oregon's probably better. Obviously, uh, you know, Ohio State's probably better. Um, I like Penn State. Um, and we got Illinois, too. You know, this is a, a tough conference. Um, and there's not going to be much uh, easy games for Michigan. No, yeah. no. Yeah, I, I mean, Washington, close. I mean, I, I don't know if they're going to be – I mean, they might not even be favored in some of these games. They'll probably be favored against Illinois, but they might not be favored against Washington. Uh, and Well, according to the ESPN FBI, FBI predictor, there's over a 60% chance that Washington might beat Michigan. Yeah, fifty-five so, percent according to the ESPN track. I don't know how much I trust that, but yes, uh, there'll be yeah according to that. And you know, Washington that that they were they're not they're no slouch. You could certain they certainly could slip up against a team like Washington. And like I would give Mich like if Michigan were actually be able to make the playoffs, I would be totally just floored. Like I don't think they have much of a chance like I, I don't think this did much to save their season and like like I said just because one thing goes well it's like I can go to the casino and win a lot of money one day but I know that if I go back the next week that's not going to happen if I keep going back that's not going to keep happening it's a similar thing when you have a quarterback who doesn't throw like eventually that's going to catch up to you especially when you play on the road um right and, and especially that, when you play right and especially when you have a head coach Who's never been a head coach at, at a at a prominent Division One uh, level like Sharon Moore? He's only yeah. ever been a coordinator for them. So, yeah, certainly. Um, I, I think that Dan, you said four teams from the Big Ten. I, I don't think they're going to end up getting four teams. Although there are four teams from the Big Ten, I could see getting into the playoffs. I don't think no, no, all no. four. I was no, no. What I was referring to was that there are currently. There are currently six undefeated Big Ten teams. I think that four of them are actually good. That's what I'm, that's what I'm, that's what I'm trying to say. I never alluded to the fact that I think four teams will make the playoff. I think that's too far fetched. It may end up only being two. So just to, yeah. just to clarify well, who do you that. think's not good of the undefeated teams? Right. Exactly. Right. No, I'm saying who do you think isn't good of the undefeated teams? Oh, I mean, I think the jury is. The jury's still out in Illinois. The jury's still out on Rutgers. The jury's still out in Indiana. There's a couple of them. So yeah, I mean, for from the Big Ten, the four teams I could see being making the playoffs are uh, Ohio State, Oregon, uh, USC, and um, and Penn State. Those are the I four agree. teams that are most likely. I agree with that. That would be most likely to make it, and. And Notre Dame very much affects all of that because it very much depends on what USC does against Notre Dame. There's no way a ten and two. I don't think uh, a ten and two USC team makes it if they, assuming they beat Penn State and lose to Notre Dame. Just like I don't think a ten and two Penn State team makes it either, assuming they lose to USC uh, on the road and Ohio State. Right. But a, an eleven and one Notre Dame team definitely makes it. Oh, for sure, because. Notre Dame has the benefit of picking their own schedule, so of course. Well, every team to some extent picks their own schedule, but yes. Um, but any 11-1 and one team, it's like it, it pretty much any 11-1 and one team in the country probably will make it, and Notre Dame is no exception to that. And USC is a very good win. Um, it, like, it, I, like, I think I could see there being three, possibly three, Big Ten teams, and but probably two if USC beats Penn State and then loses to Notre Dame. Yeah, I, I, I think they're probably going to be three. Well. There's a lot of great teams in the SEC that's going to take a lot of those spots. I mean, obviously we know the Big Ten and the SEC are both deep, um, but right now the SEC has a lot of those teams ranked in the top five and top ten, and the SEC is going to take a lot of those spots. 
which is not going to leave a lot of room for a lot of uh, Big Ten teams. So I'm going to say three of the Big Ten teams make it. I'd probably say, uh, you know, Ohio State, um, Oregon, and uh, Penn State right now. Yeah, it look it looks like it, but I don't. But there's no way USC, Penn State, and Notre Dame all make it. Of those three teams, one of them is going to be out for sure. Even though I think all three of them have a really good chance. And you know, another Big Ten story just to talk about a little bit. Your Illinois Zan, your Illinois team beats Nebraska. Yep. In, I mean, in overtime. Was, yeah, I mean, and this was a shock to everyone. I mean, the last time. That you'd have that you'd see Illinois start four and zero was you know 2011 and then before that you have to go all the way back to the 1950s. This was a this was a huge shock to everyone to win on a Friday night stage like that in Lincoln, Nebraska, in front of 86,000. Um, I mean, and it doesn't really get, get too much more exciting than that. I think there's a lot of momentum and buzz around this program. What Brett Bielema has been able to do, Luke Altmaier only having one interception so far this season, and then seeing Pat Ryan have a break a year already with six touchdown receptions and the defense putting up the numbers that they are. It's definitely an underrated win, a win that's getting uh, rightful national attention. But I think the real test is going to be when Illinois plays one of these elite teams and they have a chance to do that that this week going to State College and trying to beat a Penn State team for the first time since Bielema's first year in 2021. I thought this game was awesome. I thought Nebraska – had multiple chances to win. I think Illinois was was able to was able to eke some stuff out at the end to make sure that that game went to overtime. And I think it's just one of those things where you look from an early season perspective. Um, you got to win games like this. And Illinois was poor in the one score game department last year. So to see an instant turnaround, what they've been able to do has been really cool. I think four and zero is a good start, but it's really going to come down to October because October is going to be their biggest stretch. You get Penn State at the end of this month. Then you got to play uh, Michigan, obviously, as we just alluded to. And then you got to play Oregon, who's more than likely going to be a, a top five to top three team by the time uh, by the time Illinois goes to Eugene. So this is a good win. Um, it, it's definitely a solid win, but this is not um, the overblown win that a lot of what's, that a lot of social media is talking about. But th- this needs to be a one game at a time approach for them and for Nebraska. There's not too much to hang their hat on. The disappointing thing, though, is is they keep losing these games when they are a top 25 team. That's something that they're going to have to fix in order for um, in order for um, in order for Nebraska to get back to the relevance that they were um, in the mid 90s and the early 2000s. What did you guys think of this game? I mean, it, it was a great game. It looked uh, this used to. I mean, I used to think of a game like Illinois versus the. Versus Nebraska as like a, a snooze fest type of game, I, like a few years ago. But this was obviously a, a great game. Uh, Nebraska has gotten a lot better. I mean, two years ago, Nebraska was a, just like the one of the. They, I would say they were like the laughing stock of the Big Ten just a few years ago. Uh, but ever since they uh, ever ever since they upgraded at quarter, like they they upgraded at quarterback. And Matt Rule has done a great job with Nebraska. And also, I do want to give a lot of credit to, like, Luke Altmaier, the quarterback at Illinois. So far, he's having a great year. Um, I, I don't think this game affects the Big Ten playoff picture very likely. Um, it could, but I don't think it likely does. Uh, I don't know, Anthony. Did you have any reaction to this? Yeah, I thought this was a tremendous game. Um, you know, Nebraska, um, I know Zan was talking about his concerns about these losing these low, uh, you know, close games, but I would have no concerns as a, you know, Nebraska fan. Um, they have a lot of things to build on. I think Matt Rowe is a great coach uh, in college. I think he definitely fits college a lot better than he does in the NFL. Um, just in his second year, we saw last year how many close games they had and how many games where their quarterback was just costing them at the end. Um, and Dylan Riola, for a freshman quarterback, that guy's phenomenal. Um, I know he, uh, his idol is Pat Mahomes, um, but he literally looks like a carbon copy of Pat Mahomes. I mean, he he's does. got a side Dude, arm passes. No, he's got a yeah. rocket arm. When I first, like, first of all, I think that, like, a lot of it is very much, like, intentional, but some of it is just very natural just from the way he moves. Like, you can't really fake that unless you're, like, an amazing actor, which I'm sure he isn't. Like, some of that seems very natural, but when I first saw Dylan Rayola on social media – 
I thought it was Patrick Mahomes wearing a Nebraska jersey, and I just thought the whole thing was like, oh, Nebraska has a new quarterback, and it was like Patrick Mahomes. Like I thought for some reason Patrick Mahomes is wearing a Nebraska jersey. That's how similar they are. And I also saw this tweet where it's like he has a brother who committed, and he looks just like Jackson Mahomes. <laughs> like he 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 is like milking this looks like Patrick Mahomes thing. <laughs> yeah, he's definitely using Dry. it to his benefit, and and why not? Even Pat Mahomes is going along with it, tweeting out little cuzzo. So it's uh, <laughs> it's pretty funny, uh, what's going on in Nebraska. But I like Dylan Raiola just for a freshman, and you know what's he going to be like when he's a sophomore and junior? Um, I remember back when he's a junior in high school. You know, I always thought he's been the top quarterback in the class of 2024. I know a lot of people like DJ Lagway, um, but I just think the way Dylan Raiola plays, um, I think it's phenomenal. Um, and he's making a lot of great plays and making Nebraska a lot better. But on the Illinois side, I mean, look, Altmaier. I mean, that's got to be one of the best stories in college football. I mean, it's a quarterback that I really didn't like heading into the season, and he's really proving me wrong. I mean, I know it's too early to be talking about who's the best quarterback in the conference, but right now you can make an argument that, you know, Luke Altmaier may have been, may have has been the best quarterback in the Big Ten so far this season. I mean, the guy's been pretty much flawless this season. He's been pretty good. I mean, how many quarterbacks have played better than him this season? Not saying that he's going to play like that the rest of the year, but right now, how many quarterbacks in this conference has played better than him? Not many, if any. Um, so the guy's been phenomenal. Illinois' defense has stepped up when needed. Obviously, in overtime, they stepped up. They got some great players. I like Xavier Scott. He's a tremendous player. Um, but, you know, Illinois is definitely going to have to see, you know, when they play these great teams like Penn State, we'll really get to see how great Luke Altmaier is and how great this team is. But either way, this is a great season for him, and I couldn't be happier um, for the Illinois University. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a great win. Yeah, I would say I would say it's a great win too, and it's also one of those wins where you know usually with these college football programs, it takes three to four years to finally fully develop a program, and potentially this is the signature win that finally in your for the prep you and my era that that Illinois fans and just the Illinois program can look back on. and say, Yeah, this is the win that, sp that sprung us towards turning the corner, being a consistent winner, because you guys have to realize he's arguably, this is how poor the Illinois program has been. He's arguably the best coach that Illinois has had since the, since the late 1980s, early 1990s. But to see Illinois even remotely get back to this kind of success is is something that's a big shock and it's for full transparency sake. The best season that I ever saw during my four years in college was six and seven. So to take four and no oh, this early in the year, I'll take it. So yeah. Yeah. All right. So I do want to talk about uh this Colorado beating Baylor. Uh Colorado beats Baylor and that was an amazing I mean th there's really nothing to say other than that was I was floored when I saw that, that Hail Mary. I mean, by the way, the play before that, uh, they, they actually, it, it was a failed, it was a fail Mary. Uh, people might forget that. That was an amazing play by Shador Sanders. Uh, that was like, that was as amazing of a finish as I could have seen. Um, I understand this is not like a ranked, uh, like this is not a ranked matchup or anything, but it was a huge game. It was, uh, I was glad because I had Colorado. Uh, this was just an amazing finish. And the Colorado kids, all the Colorado fans all stormed the field. Um, to me, what was amazing in overtime, they all stormed the field. What was amazing to me, I don't know if you guys noticed this, but right after the ref said the ruling on the field is a fumble, they, they, uh, the kids all stormed the field right away and knocked down the goalpost without hearing it is under further review. So they had already stormed the field and taken down the goalpost while they were reviewing the play. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> while they were still reviewing the play, what would have actually happened if it turns out that what would have happened if it turned out that like they reviewed it and it was a touchdown? What would they have done then? I think they would have had to request everybody leave, request everybody leave the field, and there's a good chance that Colorado would have gotten fined after the game. Yeah, that that would have been uh, that would have been a. Imagine if that would have happened. Uh, 
I, I find it, by the way, like, what is it with the security? Like, I don't have a problem with field storming or anything, but what is it with the security at these games that it is just that weak? That they couldn't, like, like, it, like, like something like this could never happen at, like, a professional game. Like, the security yeah. must be really bad. Um I, security I mean, must be really bad, or security just simply wasn't prepared for it, which they should have been, considering that it's technically like their first major game against a Big 12 opponent. They, I, I think they should have been more prepared than what they actually were, and they probably are regretting a lot of decisions that they made from an administrative standpoint because it was clear that they were not prepared for that at all. So, which, yeah. by the way, as someone who has no dog in the fight, Whatsoever, and as someone who thought that Baylor was going to cover, I was a little bit disappointed uh, re regarding that fact. But I will say this, though. I think it's a little bit uncalled for to storm the field when both of these teams were unranked. I mean, and this was not a significant win whatsoever for Colorado. It was just simply put a, a win. That's all That's all it was. I, it, it was not like they beat number one, number two, number three. They beat, a, they beat an unranked Baylor team that's kind of in a similar position to what Colorado is in anyway in terms of trying to build a program. So I I mean I, I'm not mad at anybody who's storming the field, but I I don't think that, that was an appropriate field storm per se. And to be and to be quite honest with you, the the, the blame that this should fall on is Baylor because as as we alluded to, they were up by 14 at, at one point in this game and a chance to close the game out. The, it could have prevented all of this from happening, but instead they got complacent, they got too comfortable, and they let this again stick away, and they let Shadur Sanders do his thing. So I don't know. I just think there's more to blame than just a bunch of, to me, innocent college kids storming the field. Or if if they if if they don't want to get it stormed, don't lose. <laughs> well, no. By the way, this is I completely disagree. This is absolutely field storm worthy. I mean. This was an incredible, amazing finish. Now, it's not necessarily the win. Beating Baylor in and of itself is not field storm worthy. Like when Tennessee beat Alabama, them beating Alabama in right. and of itself is field right. storm worthy. But right. it was this finish, the the way they came back from a, a two touchdown deficit. I mean, if this isn't field storm worthy, I don't know what it is. And, and not just that, but like I'll say. Like Colorado, like that's probably why part of the reason why this is court storm worthy, field storm worthy to them because like it, it, the reason is because they're not that good of a program. Like they don't normally beat FBS teams. Like they have a losing record against FBS teams, and just beating an FBS team is like now in the Deion Sanders era after he sort of revived the program a little bit. Yeah, that makes it a bit more field. Uh, makes it a bit more field storm worthy. Um, what do you yeah, think? I, I definitely, I definitely think it was, uh, you know, worthy of uh, storming the field. I mean, like you said, Nick, for a Colorado team that's not used to winning, I mean, I feel like any win for them is storm worthy. Um, and you know, this win was definitely something that you know I think they did need. You no, know, obviously Colorado, they want to say they're competing to win, you know, the Big Twelve, but we know that's not reality. I think what they're competing to do is win six or seven games. I think their ultimate goal for a successful season, as I said before multiple times, they really want to make a bowl game. I think that would be a real successful season for them. And I think this win gives them real close because obviously as the schedule goes on, it's only going to get harder. So they have to try to get as many wins early on as they can so they can hit that six or seven win mark. Um, and, man, this was a tremendous game. I mean, basically, essentially, they had two Hail Marys that they essentially were successful. It's just Will Shepard dropped it right in his hand. Yeah, Will so Shepard dropped it. <laughs> they basically did it twice in a row. And one thing I want to say, obviously, Shador Sanders played great. I love Shador Sanders. I think he's a great quarterback. But – what about Travis Hunter? Obviously, the guy had a great game, had over 130 yards. But I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but the last play was his idea. He said he knew that they were going to put two or three guys on him, and they were going to put all their focus on him. So he said, how about I run to the other side of the end zone, which is going to leave either someone open or someone one-on-one -on, -one on the other side. Now, how many star players would not only have the intelligence, the awareness, but also the unselfishness to be able to call a play like that to basically say, don't give it to me. Use me as a decoy so we can win. 
I mean, that just goes Very to show you how great of a player and how great of a person and character Travis Hunter is. And I don't care what NFL team he is, uh, there is. I know it's kind of a weak quarterback class, but if I'm an NFL team, I want Travis Hunter over anybody. I think that guy's a tremendous player. He has a lot to do with the success of Colorado, obviously, Shador Sanders as well. But, man, I love Travis Hunter and everything about him. Yeah, and by the way, Travis Hunter, like he's like to me, he's my Heisman pick. I mean, I don't think he's most likely to win, but I think he should win. Um, he's almost like the Shohei Otani of football, of college football. Like he's playing all sides of the ball. He's playing almost every snap of every game. We've never seen anything like this. And he's good at it too. It's not like he's just playing every snap. He excels at he excels at it. He plays offense, defense, and special teams. We almost never see that. Yeah, I agree. He's definitely the best player in college football right now. Yeah. Um, so, I would yeah, say not, I, I would say I would go a step further. And, and wouldn't you say that he's the best player in college football? He's the most exciting player in college football. Period. He is. Yeah, no, he's without he question the most popcorn. exciting. You can you can hate Colorado. You can love Colorado, but he is popcorn material no matter who they're playing and. It, Everybody and everybody knows that when that when the game's on the line and the and the and the, and the hype shines bright, if you will, he's the he's the guy that wants the ball in his hands. And as you just alluded to, Anthony, very few receivers would do what he did on that final play. So, yeah, I love the guy. I mean, think about it. the guy right now may be the best receiver this year in college football. I mean, what he's done to a wide receiver position is unbelievable. But then he's also <laughs> shutting down the number one receiver and he's the top ten corner. I mean, the guy's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I and I can and I can tell you this: as long as he plays well, no matter how many games uh, Colorado wins, he will keep he will keep them in a lot of games single handedly. I'll say I'll say that. Yeah. Uh, so I do want to talk a little. Move on to the SEC. Uh, Tennessee they beat Oklahoma twenty five to fifteen. Um, I mean, I, I have a few takeaways from this. One is Oklahoma's offense is a total disaster. Jackson Arnold got benched. Uh, if you want to know, you guys know what uh, Jackson Arnold's QBR was? Someone in the 40s, no? Right? <laughs> no, it was 1.6. Jeez. I've never seen a QBR that low before. Uh, that's how I bad. Haven't. I haven't. That's crazy. That, that That's pretty – I mean, I'm sure we, could, we might be able to find uh, some example of it. Uh, but, yeah, Oklahoma's – Oklahoma's offense was just non-existent. Um, it seemed more systemic than about one particular guy. I mean, Jackson Arnold was not good. The quarterback problem was a part of it, but I don't think it strictly was about Jackson Arnold. I think, uh, it, I, I think no matter what, it's going to be, uh, it's clearly going to be a, a, a pretty big problem. Uh, the, uh, 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 I, I don't think they're going to be that much better with Michael Hawkins. Uh, I think M Michael Hawkins, uh, I mean, it, Jackson Arnold, I mean, he might not start again. He might not start another game unless Michael Hawkins gets injured or something. But he might not start another game. Hawkins actually, he didn't even play the full game. He, he, he came in in the second quarter. He actually led the team in rushing. Uh, and it's not a good sign when your quarterback, usually it's not a good sign when a quarterback, especially one who only played like half the game, is leading your team in rushing that like that that's not usually a good sign their their rushing what their rushing attack was on average they averaged 1.1 rush yards per carry in fairness that also includes sacks so that distorts it a little bit but it, it was still their run game was totally non-existent Oklahoma their offense needs to like start over because it is just a disaster yeah, they need to start over for sure, and they need to start over in a hurry because this was supposed to be one of the premier teams in the new look SEC, and they look and, and they look anything but that. And Tennessee just went in there and manhandled them. I didn't think Tennessee was going to be able to do what they did to them, but he just dominated them from pillar to post. And the score does, and the score doesn't indicate how not close that game actually was. They were killing them midway through the third quarter. That game was over. So. I don't know. Let me tell you this, though. Given how how much of a new look Alabama is and, and how much hype there still is around Georgia, Tennessee is a sleeper, in my opinion, to 
making some noise in the in the top half of the SEC later in the year. And this was definitely a statement win to beat to beat the Oklahoma team that is supposed to be one of the new world juggernauts in the SEC. They look anything they look anything but that right now. So yeah, that's 100% correct. Um, you know, you know, with Tennessee, just like Josh Hapel said, you know, this isn't even the best you no know, they, they could be. They're still improving. There's still a lot of things that they can improve on. You know, we, we finally have a Tennessee team that we always knew they could score points and win shootouts. But now they have a defense that can stop the opposing team as well. And that's what makes them so scary. And even as an Alabama fan, right now I'm terrified of Tennessee. I think Tennessee may be a better team than Alabama right now. Tennessee's got everything clicking for them. And even though e uh, Nico Ilamaliava – um, has it been 100% great? He's going to continue improving, and the offense is going to get better as well. So this team, you know, is firing on all cylinders. Um, and for Oklahoma, their offensive line's bad. Um, their receivers are injured and not playing well. And Jackson Arnold can't do anything when the play breaks down. Obviously, you know, they had a lot of hype coming in. He was the lead 11 MVP. He was one of the top recruits, and he had a lot to do with why Dylan Gabriel left Oklahoma. They put all their eggs in one basket. They really didn't bring in anybody through the transfer portal. And he basically, Jackson Arnold for Oklahoma, was supposed to be what Nico Iomaliaba was for Tennessee. Unfortunately, that hasn't come to fruition, and now they're stuck here playing the young quarterback in Hawkins. Now, I do think Hawkins gives them a different, you know, dual threat and can make plays when the play breaks down. But, man, this is devastating for Oklahoma, and I'm not sure how they're going to be able to fix the offense this season. Um, But Tennessee, on the flip side, is a juggernaut, and, you know, they can beat anybody on any given Saturday. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And by the way, let me just point out, Nico Iamaleava, he did he's having a great year, but he did not play a very good game. No. He, uh, didn't. he, he did not play a very good game, but Tennessee established their run. They ran the, the Tennessee ran uh, Tennessee ran the ball like 50 times, 52 times to be exact. They ran the ball 52 times. Uh so they were really able they they were they were able to establish the run. Yamaleava, he didn't play great, but I think it's very telling. If you can, if your quarterback doesn't play well and you can still dominate the team on the road, that still is a very good sign. And I would say two years ago, I thought that that was the best Tennessee team I've ever seen. I think this year's Tennessee team is better than the one two years ago because of their defense. I mean, Oklahoma, they're becoming more and more like Iowa. They're they're becoming like the <laughs> Iowa of the South. Like they, they have a really good defense. Like there's no doubt they have a really good defense, but they don't play offense at all. It's a, no, it's as if it was completely neglected. But Nick, well, one thing I would say back to that though is you're saying that they're like Iowa, but Kirk Ferentz doesn't have the recruits or near the talent that Oklahoma has. So obviously Iowa doesn't have the quarterback talent that that uh, Oklahoma's bringing in. So there's no excuse. Oklahoma should have a much better offense than Iowa. And to counter you, Nick, to you a little bit, even with Iowa's flaws, they still managed to win nine or ten games every year because it's, because it's sustainability, which is something that Oklahoma simply doesn't have. So, well, well, Oklahoma would never be able to manage the win to win the way Iowa has. Now it's a little different, but going forward, now that they're in the SEC, they play a really, really tough. They're going to play much tougher schedules than Iowa has throughout most of their history because Iowa was always in the Big Ten West and the Big Ten West was always very weak. So right. Iowa usually played very weak schedules and that's why they were able to win nine or ten games. Good point, uh, good point. Usually. Yeah. Whereas good Oklahoma, point. they have, I mean, oh, I mean, speaking of scheduling, by the way, I mean, the scheduling in college football is out of control when you look at the disparities. Like in professional sports, every team sort of has like, in professional sports, some teams have easier schedules than others, but they're all kind of around the same. You know what I mean? Like, it, there's not that much debate talk about how one NFL team is that much easier of a schedule than another NFL team. But in college football, it is out of control. Even within conferences, it's out of control. Um, I mean, you look at a team like Oklahoma, their schedule is a gauntlet. They have to play, they have to play Texas at Red River. They play. On the road at Ole Miss, they play Missouri. They play at Missouri. They play Alabama, and then they play at LSU. Uh, <laughs> they could they could realistically lose four out of those five games. That is a really really tough schedule. So they're they have to play of all uh, of like the top five teams. They're playing like what four of them. 
you know, like Tennessee, Alabama, Tennessee, Alabama, uh, and uh, they're not playing Georgia, but they're, they're like their schedule is just so difficult. And if you look at a team like Missouri, Missouri, uh, well, Tennessee, well, Tennessee, Alabama, and uh, and uh, Texas, right? No, Missouri, they play. Uh, no, they play Oklahoma. They play A and M, but I don't think that's that difficult. They play Alabama on the road. That's difficult. And they play Oklahoma at home and that's it. Okay. So, so like there's a huge disparity with the, just in terms of scheduling Ole Miss. I mean, if they go 11 and one, I mean, they kind of Ole Miss, they only have to play Georgia and they have to go on the road at LSU. Georgia's schedule right. is extremely difficult. Right. Uh, I mean, honestly, Nick, I think that's why they need to establish something like, you know, um, like, Whatever you finished the season before, that's who you should play. So if you were the first team in the SEC last year, you should have the hardest schedule. If you were the worst team in the SEC, you should have the easiest schedule. And that should be how it is every year. That would be the most fair way of doing it. If you're the best team, you have the hardest schedule. No, yeah. I agree. Yeah. And although I, I don't do although about- I don't believe that's how it fully works because I think I think every team gets like four guaranteed games and 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 like Maybe two or three of them are against the same opponents. I know it. I know it fluctuates from year to year. But and Anthony, what you just said is a very good and very logistical point. One hundred, one hundred percent. Yeah, and of course, uh, we talk talk about this briefly. Missouri they struggled with Vanderbilt, winning thirty to twenty seven. Uh, they're an undefeated team. This early in the season, undefeated doesn't mean that much because it I don't think very it does. much I think, like I think I think they've. I think they played down to their competition this game, and now the and now the Boston College game. They even played. They even played that well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean they, they haven't. They, yeah, they really haven't. And uh, they're two. Uh, I mean, they they beat. They killed Buffalo and they killed Murray State. Okay, uh, that doesn't tell me anything. They didn't play a good game again. They they won against Boston College and Vanderbilt both at home. But they did not play well. Vanderbilt is the laughing stock of the SEC. <laughs> like you can't be almost losing to Vanderbilt. You, have, you can't have Vanderbilt taking you to overtime at home. And by the way, they're the 11th ranked team in the country right now, which is proof that AP should not be taken seriously. They're ranked ahead of Michigan and USC. Uh, they're not better than either of those teams. No, uh, they're not. Michigan, they're not uh, Missouri at all. is. Yeah, I mean Missouri is going to be one of those teams that will have an inflated resume because they have a good record due to a week due to a relatively weak schedule. Yeah, we said uh, a couple weeks ago, Nick, that you know we we thought that they would have a good defense, but the last two weeks, then the first half, their defense struggled. They struggled against Thomas Castellonis against Boston College, and then obviously they struggled this week against Diego Pavia. Now I know Vanderbilt has been the laughing stock of the SEC. But Vanderbilt has been sneakily good. If you look closely in a lot of their games, they've been really close. Obviously, they won against Virginia Tech. Um, they've been pretty competitive. Their offense has been, you know, a lot better than what it was a previous pass. So this definitely isn't the same Vanderbilt team. But a team like Missouri, when we thought that, you know, they're trying to be in that same conversation as Alabama and Tennessee, they can't be struggling with teams like Boston College and Vanderbilt. And it definitely seems like there may be a gap, and they may be in just the tier below them. Um, and, you know, I don't think uh, Missouri is going to be able to compete with the big boys when the time comes. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, definitely. I, um, it's going to be – I think the SEC potentially – there are six teams from the SEC that I think could be a playoff team. At the most, only five will make it. At the most. And even that might be pushing it. I'd say probably four teams. I mean, Alabama, Tennessee, Georgia, Texas, LSU, and Ole Miss all potentially could be. I don't think LSU is that good, uh, but that could be a game that Ole Miss loses. They're going on the road. You never know what might happen. And Alabama could lose that game too, by the way. Two years ago, the same, they lost to LSU. So you never know how that might work out. Um, Yeah, I agree. I think there will be probably five teams as well. Texas, obviously Georgia, Tennessee, Bama. And uh, I'd probably go with Ole Miss as that fifth team right now to make it. I personally think looking at Missouri's schedule, I think that there are three games that they could easily lose. They could lose in College Station against Texas A&M. They could easily lose the South Carolina game because South Carolina is a tough place to play. And you, you can never, and you, who can never count out Arkansas at the end of the year. I know Arkansas is not really big in a good program ever since Brett Bielema, um was was let go there a couple years ago, but. 
there are a couple of trap games where Missouri doesn't play well and maybe one or two of them. Uh, it, it could be it could be the end of their season and most certainly the end of their the end of their college football playoff hopes for sure. So yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, so I do want to talk about this story a little bit. Uh, this guy named Matthew Sluka, who was the UNLV quarterback, he left after an NIL dispute. Um, none of us, all I can say about this is none of us, basically he's saying that he was promised certain amounts of money by a, an assistant coach, which now he's not getting. And he was apparently promised verbally <laughs> and not in writing. Uh, this, look, the thing with this story is a lot of people are jumping on Matthew Sluka for this or jumping on NIL. Um, look, if he's promised money or promised a deal, well, you kind of have to go through on that deal, even if it's not in writing. Now, if it's not in writing, you can't necessarily prove it. We don't know who said what or what, or if there's any context, if he, like, there could be a reason, but it's like, I mean, we can't, if this is true, all I can say is we can't have assistant coaches lying to recruits about the money that they're going to make. And then not, and then not pull through with that. Like that, that just can't happen. Well, that's number one. And number two, you know, when when you go through a business transaction like that, which I'm just going to simply state it, that's that's what this is becoming these days. I uh, the, the 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 other thing that you can't have happen is you can't not have something in writing saying that that the, uh, the this player in this case Sluka was guaranteed. This amount of money, you can't go off of a verbal basis for anything. If anybody goes to, you know, a a, a, a job or some other medium where, where where a contract is part of the whole thing, you can't just have somebody verbally tell you this is this is what's going to happen without without uh with, without rehashing or making sure that there's some uh, documented thing in writing that says, "Hey, this is what we're going to guarantee you." You can either take it or leave it. So. Either, either three things could be true here. Number one, Suluka is overblowing the story and we have no idea. Number two, it could be that the UNLV football program is at fault because they guaranteed this kid money and they didn't and they didn't give it to him. And and number three, what could potentially be true is people need to really step back. And although you know NIL is supposed to be this positive thing, uh, there, there needs to be a, a ton more regulations because. At this moment in time, the NAL is the wild, wild west. Any sort of business collective, you know, with with the legal filings or whatever, can get involved. And it's just another one of these examples where it just wasn't guardrailed in the right way. So at the end of the day, everybody in this whole scenario loses. And, and, what, and it's even worse from a UNLV perspective, too, considering that they were one of the few group of five teams that people were high on to be we make the college football playoff, which would have been one of the biggest stories in all of college football. And now the a possibility is 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 dead and maybe dead for a very, very long time. So yeah. Yeah, I'm what definitely on uh, Matthew uh Lucas side. You know, basically, you know, anybody who's against him and think that he made the wrong decision, I'll say back to you is if you went to a job interview and your employer said, Hey, we're gonna start you at $20 an hour, you show up to work, work a week. And then you get your first paycheck and you're only making ten dollars an hour. Are you going to go to work the next day? I'm pretty sure they're going to not want to go to work and they're going to be calling their employer the next day and saying, "Hey, what did you with my check?" Now, at the end of the day, obviously, you know you want to have it everything in, in writing. But this goes to show you that Matthew Sluka definitely put his trust in that assistant coach. Wherever they told him to get him to go from Holy Cross to UNLV, must have been very compelling. He obviously trusted them enough to not need that, you know, physical paperwork. He trusted their word. And I guess they they let their word down. And if that's the case, you know, I don't blame Matthew Sluka. It's unfortunate for UNLV fans. They were having a great season. They beat Kansas. So they already beat a couple, you know, power four conference teams. So they look like they could potentially make the college football playoffs as maybe the potential, you know, group of five representative. But I don't blame Matthew Sluka. Um, I think he deserves to go to their transfer portal, go to maybe a power conference team and get, the, you know, the bag that he deserves. Yeah. All right. So briefly, oh, do you have something to say, Zan? Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, for, for for Matthew Sluka's sake, I hope he goes to a program that actually values him for him, gives him what he's looking for, and hopefully he can continue his college career without issue. And 
This is just a blimp in the road because if this is what this guy is known for moving forward. It's going to be it's going to be bad news because as you two alluded to, I don't think this is partially on him either. So hopefully he gets with the right program. I'm someone that can not only trust him but also put in physical writing what he's actually uh, getting from them and go and go from there. So yeah, um, yeah. So I do want to talk a little bit about the Big Twelve. Uh, Utah beats Oklahoma State. Um, briefly, I just want to talk about this. I was sort of surprised because Utah did it with their backup quarterback and on the road, and Utah is notoriously a bad road team. Uh, so I uh, and you know this very much. Uh, very much can affect the Big 12 playoff picture. I don't think – now, here's what I'll say about the Big 12. They are the pillow fight conference of Power 4 conferences right now, mainly because their two best teams just left. Um, to me, there is no way any more than one Big 12 team makes the playoff this year. I'd be yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't Yeah, I don't disagree with that. And uh, as as you just alluded to, Utah was able to do it with a backup quarterback. But once – Cam Rising is fully healthy. This this Utah team, I think, is a chance to be the sole team that potentially makes the playoff because if that guy's 100%, that guy's arm is one of the best arms in college football. He knows how to manage the game. He's come back from deficits before. This was a get-right game for Utah. If they can get this entire offense uh, ready to go in 100%, this team will be tough to beat come late October, early November. And this is, and this is a critical win against... I mean, that Oklahoma State is usually one of these trap teams that beats a team that they're not supposed to beat. And this was one of those games where Oklahoma State had a ton of opportunities to win and they couldn't do it. And this was just simply another example of that. So, yeah, I was real impressed with Utah. For them to win this game without Cam Rise, I mean, they had freshman quarterback Zach Olson's little brother in there, um, and they were able to win this game. I mean, Utah, yeah, I think only one, you know, Big 12 team should and will make the playoffs. But Utah might be a, a team that can win a playoff game against one of these other teams in the other conferences, especially if Cam Rising comes back. You know, he could also use his legs as well. So he's a dual threat. Um, he, this team's a very experienced team that has a lot of fifth and sixth year seniors. And right now, out of all the teams in the Big 12, you know, we've seen, you know, Kansas State, you know, fall to uh, BYU in an upset. Right now, it's got to be Utah and then everybody else. Yeah, I don't yeah. disagree. Yeah. And in the ACC, James Madison beat North Carolina. They put up 70 points. That's got to be a record. It's almost hard to believe this is the same Mac Brown that's coaching UNC that that won a national championship with Texas. Um, now, this is not very significant for the playoff picture, but honestly, I think two ACC teams likely make the playoffs this year. Uh, people mm -hmm. like to write off Clemson and an 11 and one Clemson team. If they're only losses to Georgia and in the ACC championship, potentially, or if Miami loses to Clemson, they're only lost to the ACC championship game. Miami will be du double digit favorites in every single one of their games, except Louis Villain, which they'll be single digit favorites. Clemson will be favorited, will be favorites in all of the rest of their games. There's a good chance both teams run the table until the championship. Um, you know, uh, I think the ACC could easily be getting two teams. Okay. Yeah, I have nothing else to add really other than this is a signature win for the James Madison program. And it just goes to show that uh, maybe the glory years of North Carolina football with Mitch Trubisky and Drake May could potentially be gone. It's going to be interesting to see how they bounce back from this because this is a game that you can't afford to lose, especially in the middle of September when this is supposed to be your quote unquote easier part of the schedule. And uh, North Carolina just made it a lot harder on itself. That's for that's for sure. Yeah, it was definitely an absolutely uh, stat line. I mean, how many times do you see a team put up 70 points against a power conference team? And then for the quarterback, um, you know, Barnett the third, who had seven touchdowns. I mean, what a performance by him. He had to be the best player of the week. Um, but for the ACC, obviously, yeah, it's no Big Ten. It's no SEC. But I agree with Nick, probably two teams. It looks like Miami, um, you know, can't be stopped. And preseason, I had Clemson um, preseason to win this conference. Um, I like Clemson a lot. It looks like those young receivers are finally starting to flourish. Clay Klubnick is starting to put it all together. So I did Clemson and Miami. Don't, uh, you know, put down Louisville. But I don't know if Louisville could compete with those two teams. So I agree with Nick. I think Miami and Clemson would be in the playoffs. Yeah. I could see um, it. Yeah. So let's just go to picks. Uh, again, picks for the weekend. Uh, Sounds good. Georgia. Uh, mine at Alabama, Georgia's giving two and a half. I, I was torn on this game for a while. 
Um, but I, I think I, I think I'm going to go with Alabama. I think I'm going to go with Alabama. Uh, they're the home team. Kirby Smart historically has struggled against Alabama. I don't know if he has an Alabama problem or a Nick Saban problem. Uh, this is going to be a really tough game for Georgia. Um, even though I think Georgia is a tremendous team, I think Alabama is very. I think Alabama's offense is also is very good. I see Alabama pulling this off. So I'll I'll take I'll take Alabama plus two and a half, which basically means they're probably going to win outright. Right. Um. Yeah. I mean, this is obviously the best game of the week. Um. Hotel rooms in Tuscaloosa, I think, have been sold out since March. So uh, if you have a ticket, congratulations. And if you don't, uh, a good good luck because you'll be watching it on TV. Because I can guarantee you, you won't be getting into any of the local bars there either. Um. This is the unofficial SEC championship game before. Or the SEC championship game, although oh, Texas may have something to say about that on October 19th when they face Georgia. So uh, this could potentially be the winner remains alive in the SEC playoff picture and the loser goes home. It also might be too early to say that too. But I'm going to go on the same wavelength as Nick D here. I think Alabama historically has done much better against Georgia, and I just don't see how you can how you can pick against Alabama if, I mean, given the environment they're in, given all the SEC championship success that they've had, and also given all of the home success they've had, they, they've been a wagon at uh, Brian Denny Stadium for over a decade now. And as long as Alabama's defense can make a couple of plays at the end of the game to frustrate the person back and maybe put him into a fourth and goal situation with the game on the line, I like my chances start with Alabama. Give me Alabama to win this game 24 to 21 and cover the two and a half points for us. Well, obviously, you know me as the Alabama fan. Um, this is, uh, you know, the game of the week right here. And uh, I don't know if you know this, but we have 18 on the helmet because we have 18 national championships. And uh, this year we're trying to turn that into 19. <laughs> but uh, I'm not sure if it's going to happen this year. And honestly, I know, um, you know, Kirby Smart in Georgia has struggled with Alabama. Um, Alabama has been their kryptonite. Um, they cost them a few championships. They were the reason why Georgia didn't make the playoffs last year. And in my opinion, I think Alabama would have beat them in the national championship had the receivers didn't get hurt in the first half. Alabama was probably winning that game up until that point. So, you know, Alabama does have Georgia's number. But I think that had a lot to do with Nick Saban. Um, Kirby Smart, obviously, you know, knew Nick Saban. They knew each other well. Um, so they kind of, you know, had a feeling for each other. I don't think Kalen DeBoer has that same feeling and um, knows and has the knowledge that Nick Saban had. On Kirby Smart, um, I think this has to be a must win, not for the playoff per se, but I think this is a must win mentally for Kirby Smart. I mean, your kryptonite and nemesis has been Nick Saban. Now, if Nick Saban is not there and you still lose to Alabama, I'm not sure mentally how you could get over that. You know, it's definitely just going to keep proving the point that, you know, you can't beat Alabama. So I think Georgia is going to want to win this and prove that this is a new era in the SEC without Nick Saban. Um, you know, I love Jalen Melrose. I think he's got a great arm. He could throw the ball deep. He's definitely um, been much improved this year with the passing game, but um, he needs time in the pocket. Um, and I think Georgia has a great pass rush. They're going to blitz him a lot. And I think by blitzing him, that's not going to give Alabama time for guys like Ryan Williams to get open downfield for Jalen Melrose to, you know, hit him. Um, and I think Georgia is going to be very physical. It's going to be the most physical team that Alabama has played against. And I think Ryan Williams being 17 years old may struggle against that physicality. So, you know, unfortunately, I know I'm an Alabama fan, but I'm going to go Georgia to win and cover the points. All right. Uh, Notre, Louisville at Notre Dame. Uh, Louisville at uh, Louisville at Notre Dame. Notre Dame's giving six and a half. Uh, I like Notre Dame. They're playing at home. Notre Dame looks – they've really bounced back since losing to Northern Illinois. Uh, I talked about how Notre Dame is a really good chance to make the playoffs. Uh, this is going to be a big test for Louisville. It looks like it's going to be the toughest game. Yeah, this is a big test for Louisville, and this is no disrespect to to Jeff Brom and everybody over there, but this is their first real true test um, so far this season to go into a hostile environment like Notre Dame Stadium, where you know Notre Dame Stadium is a sacred place in South Bend, and with the way that Riley Leonard's been playing the last few weeks, I think Notre Dame wins this game relatively easily. I th I think they win by about 10. I think they cover the points. And I just think there's too much talent in that Notre Dame side for, for me to justify picking Louisville. The only way that Louisville maybe has a chance to win this game is if maybe they're losing by two to three points or up by one in halftime. Maybe I'll give them a shot. But to go into Notre Dame and 
an environment with the way Notre Dame has been playing and, and just simply with the talent that they have. It doesn't compare to Louisville. And as I just alluded to, I don't think Louisville's schedule has been anything all that special, and this is really their first true test. So, yeah, yeah. I agree with you guys. I'm going to go Notre Dame as well to win and cover the points. I think Notre Dame is still pissed off about that Northern Illinois loss. Um, they definitely got a chip on their shoulder since that. Um, I think that was their one slip up early on the year. I think they're going to go on a run here to the uh, college football playoffs. Um, on Louisville side, I think Tyler Shunk is playing the best football as he, you know, as he had in his career. He's been a co- quarterback that's always had the talent that's kind of bounced around. I think he's finally found his place. Um, Louisville's got good, uh, you know, corners. Uh, Louisville's got a good pass rush. Um, I think Jeff Brown's one of the most underrated coaches. Um, he was great at Purdue. He's doing good at Louisville. They had a good season last year, but I don't think their run defense is going to be able to stop Notre Dame's uh, running game. Um, I think Love's a great running back. I think Riley Leonard, dual threat, could use his legs as well. So I got Notre Dame to win and cover as well. All right. So uh, another Big Ten game. Zan, this is your team. Illinois at Penn State. Um, I, I'm i sorry, Zan, but I, I love Penn State this game. I hate no, how much it's, I love Penn State. No, no, no. Um, it's, it, it's okay. And- <laughs> go, go, going into Happy Valley in a whiteout environment, I can't I – can't, I, I know, I know it's gonna be, I know it's gonna be an uphill battle. Yeah, uh, I, I just like Penn State because Illinois is just coming off a really great win against Nebraska, and Penn State is a very good team. It is a really tough environment to play in, um, so I, I'm going, I'm going with Penn State. Anthony, what do you think? I'll, I'll go, I'll go last on this one. Yeah, obviously, I love Penn State as well. I think Drew Aller is playing good. Obviously, Illinois is playing good. We said, you know, about Luke Altmaier earlier today. Um, but obviously, I think Penn State's going to win. But I just feel like this is just way too many points. I understand Penn State's the home team. I think Penn State's going to win. But I'm not sure they're going to be able to cover. I think this may be a low-scoring game. I do think Drew Aller and Nick Singleton would do enough and make more plays than Luke Altmaier and Penn State's offense. But give me Penn State to win. But I don't think they cover the point spread. All right. Yeah, I'm going with the same with the same vibe as you and as when Anthony. I think it's going to be a close game. I think as long as Luke Altmaier stays upright, Illinois may even have an early lead, maybe mid first quarter. But I think it's going to be later in the game where Illinois' defense starts to break down. I think that Drew Aller has a career day, and I think that Penn State overcomes the mistakes that they, they made a couple years ago in State College, where they lost the game in nine overtimes. So I think they barely beat Illinois, and. Uh, I also think it's one of those games where even if Illinois uh, doesn't win the game, they're still going to be they're still going to be respectable in the eyes of in the eyes of the of the of the committee and the in the AP poll voters because they'll have given Penn State their toughest game early in the season. So I'm with you on that, Anthony. I think Penn State wins, but I do think Illinois covers the 18. I'm going to stick with the same score that I gave on my most recent edition of Band and those breakdowns, which at the time that we're recording this came out earlier today. I th- that Penn State wins the game 24 to 21 and hands Illinois its first loss of the season. So all right. All right. Uh Oklahoma State at uh Oklahoma State at Kansas State quickly. Uh two Big 12 teams that we talked about. Uh, I feel I I I like uh this is tough with both it's tough with it's tough because both teams are coming off tough losses. Um but uh, you, you know what? I, I'm going with Kansas State minus five and a half, though I, I hate it. I, I don't feel good about it, but I'm going with Kansas State. Yeah, I like Kansas State too. I think it's going to be a close game, but I think, but I think them being at home on an environment and just them having the success that they've had the last couple of years, um, I it would be hard for us to, to not pick a to not pick a Kansas State team that you know is playing an Oklahoma State team that I think is. Struggled a little bit, had a chance to beat Utah. Obviously, didn't do that. Um, I feel like this is one of those games where it could be where it could be a swing game in the conference as well, where whoever loses this game will probably be regretting by in November, wondering if they had this one back. And I think that Oklahoma State is going to fall victim to it. So, yeah, I I agree with both you guys. I'm going to go Kansas State as well. Both teams obviously coming off the loss and look flat. Obviously, I think Kansas State loss was more embarrassing. It was a blowout against BYU. Oklahoma State, um, you know, losing to Utah is nothing to be upset about. But I think Kansas State, you know, being more embarrassed and probably being more upset 
also being the home team, I think they'll be, uh, you know, more pumped up to win this game. I think A.B. Johnson will play better. I don't truly trust Oklahoma State's quarterback position. I know Alan Bowman has his moments, but I don't like him as much. I do I do think A.B. Johnson for Kansas State has tremendous amounts of potential. So I got Kansas State to win and cover as well. All right. Yeah, and I think the, yeah, and I think and I and I think the spread is just absolutely perfect. So if you if, if there's if there's one guaranteed favor that I would take this week, it's K State. So Colorado at UCF. This is a trap game. I love this. Feels like a trap game. I love you. I, I hate how much I love UCF. Colorado coming off a really big win. I still don't think Colorado, even though they had a great win against Baylor. They're still not that good of a team, and UCF is sneaky good. They're going on the road. Um, g- give me UCF minus 14. What do you think, Anthony? Um, honestly, I think this is way too many points to uh, to give up. I do think UCF is a great team. Um, RJ uh, Harvey's got to be one of the best running backs in all college football. Obviously, Hudson, the wide receiver, has been phenomenal. KJ Jefferson coming over from Arkansas has been pretty well. Um, I don't really like uh, UCF defensively, which is why I think Colorado and Shador Sanders and Travis Hunter will score some points. So I think UCF wins, but I don't think UCF's going to cover. Good, yeah, I don't think I don't think UCF is going to cover either. Um, there's not much more that I have to add other than the fact that I am going to make a bold prediction and say whoever has the ball last is going to win the game. And I just think E.G. Jefferson does enough to edge out Stur Sanders and scores the winning touchdown with about a minute uh, to go or so. So with that being said, I like Colorado to cover the four team, but I like UCF to barely win the game. And give me UCF to win this game 35 to 28. Ohio State uh, at Michigan State. Ohio State's giving 23 and a half. Uh, I love Ohio State this game. Uh, so far, I mean, this is going to be their toughest game, but so far their uh, their schedule has basically been little sisters of the poor. Uh, but yeah, I love, I love Ohio State. I don't think Michigan State is that good. Uh, love Ohio State's offense. Love their receiving core. Yeah, I would love to see Michigan State win this game, but I think this is too early of a test for Jonathan Smith. This is also one of several tests that Michigan State will have to overcome with either the um for the remainder of this year as they play several ranked teams. So expect a lot of losses to come Michigan State's way. I think Ohio State covers this game late in the fourth quarter, and I think that their offense is just too good. It's going to be very similar to the Marshall game a week ago, where Marshall was in the game for about a quarter and. And eventually end up getting blown out. I think the final score was 49 to 14. So it's going to be somewhere um, on that range. And I, I actually do think I'm going to make a bold prediction. I think that the starting quarterback for Michigan State gets hurt and they end the game by using multiple quarterbacks. So they're going to they're gonna have some major problems going into a very, very difficult October, which also includes Michigan. So this is going to be bad news on the night where Mark D'Antonio is going to be celebrated be, uh, before before the game. So, yeah, I got Ohio State to win this and cover. I think Ohio State, they're my preseason national champion. I think they're one of the best teams in college football. They're improving each and every week. Obviously, they had an easy schedule. Um, I think Michigan State uh, with Aiden uh, Childress, um, 19-year-old sophomore quarterback. They're a very young uh, team. Jonathan Smith coming over from Oregon State. I do think he's a good coach. I do think he'll have Michigan State um, improve, but I do think they're probably a year or two away. So I'm going to go with Ohio State to win and cover the points. One last thing I do want to say before um, I get out of here, um, you know, the University of Buffalo, my local team, was able to pull up the upset against Northern Illinois. They were able to win 23-20, to 20, one of the biggest wins for the University of Buffalo, led by Shane Dolick, linebacker, leading all college football and tackles, and it was a great win for the University of Buffalo. Congratulations, right. man. Yeah, that was a signature win for sure. All right, so uh, one last uh, unnecessary wager. So here's my unnecessary wager of the week. Uh, Clemson minus 22 uh, versus Stanford. Ohio State minus 13 and a half first half. Uh, over 15, the over in the TCU Kansas 59. Uh, USC minus seven and a half first half. Nebraska minus 10 at Purdue. And then two prop bets Ryan Williams 50 plus receiving yards for Alabama and Jalen Milrow is an anytime touchdown scorer. I That's actually think unnecessary- that part away is a chance to hit. What's the, uh, what did you put on it and what's the payout? 10 to win uh 10 the payout is 
$1,068.85. You never know. That's like winning the lottery. <laughs> the only thing I would say, Nick, as an Alabama fan, I know the 17-year-old born in 2007, Ryan Williams, has been lighting the college football on storm. I'm not sure if he's going to be able to get another touchdown against Georgia, but we shall see. If he does, I will be pumped. I need to be yards <laughs> and not touchdowns. All right. Andy, see you guys you, next week. Could you, could you imagine if that ends up being somehow the game-winning touchdown? You never you never know. <laughs> <laughs> <Our> touchdown? <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. See you guys okay. next week. This is Forever Power yeah. 5. Yeah.